Okay, well, I'm now here with Bas Pluger from Dimenko, the glasses free specialist. You're showcasing a new range of glasses free 3D TVs here, aren't you? And they're all using lenticular technology. Other displays use parallax like the 3DS. People do ask me sometimes, what is the difference, what's the advantage and disadvantage of both? Could you give us a bit of a, an overview? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the advantage of parallax. Uh, barrier is that uh, it's cheaper to manufacture in general um, and uh, it's got a proven uh, switchable technology so you can switch from 2D into 3D so that's the benefit of, uh, of Parallax however there are some uh, some very important disadvantage of, of Parallax and that is that due to the grid that you put in front of the LCD screen you lose a lot of picture quality uh, so you lose a lot of uh, light output you lose a lot of color you lose a lot of contrast uh, and therefore the picture performance gets uh, to, a, to a level that it's not really uh, acceptable for uh, applications like digital science or in, uh, in more, um, uh, let's say, technical uh, uh, applications like the medical applications or uh, forms like that. So um, I think the common understanding in the market is that lenticular technology will prevail over a uh, parallax barrier. So is that down to a cost issue? Presumably Parallax can be quite cheap. And also with Parallax, does that mean only one person can view the 3D at the same time? Um, well, with Parallax, you, due, to the old, due, due, due to the grid, you have, uh, per definition, a very limited range from where you can perceive the 3D effect. Um, so with Lenticular, we are able to increase the viewing angle to 140 degrees, giving you the free, freedom of movement in front of the screen. Whereas with Parallax Barrier, that uh, that viewing angle is very very limited, uh, and therefore, uh, yeah, the applications also for for parallax barrier become uh, more limited than we have uh, with lenticular technology. I've seen a few a few auto stereo screens, and I think you're quite unique because you have 28 views on your screens. I've seen ones with eight and 12 views. Have you managed to achieve those extra views that your competitors haven't? Yes, um, by developing a screen with 28 views, uh, that allows us to solve. Uh, a number of issues amongst others the bending issue but also um, the transition between the cones uh, that is for a viewer uh, not very uh, uh, let's say appealing to watch when you have uh, zones with a uh, blurry uh, view in between the different cones so we have been able to develop a 28 view lenticular lens uh, that allows us to have a very uh, a very good depth perception uh, uh, without having the bending effects but also um, having hardly any cone transitions anymore uh, so you can basically enjoy the 3D effect from around the display. And when you're saying banding, uh, what you're referring to is that sort of stripe, that diagonal stripe that goes across the screen when you move your head, which is a, a, a major issue of, of other auto stereo screens. Um, the problem obviously right now is there's a resolu you're losing a lot of resolution uh, with lenticular displays. Um, I think at CES they showcased a, a few 4K screens. 8K, which is the super high vision standard, will allow an, an 8G screen to be full HD. Um, are you are lenticular looking into the the higher higher resolutions and, and again is that down to costs you know to get the cost down first yes absolutely um, I think what is a, a you, that's a valid point uh, due to the uh, let's say different views you lose a bit of the resolution uh, it's difficult to really capture that in in uh, in the let's say in the conventional way because you add depth and you also have multiple views between the eyes so uh, yeah the, the the math behind it is a bit more difficult uh, and also a bit more, bit more debatable but uh, you, d you do re uh, lose some resolution with a lenticular technology and uh, with the help of 4K screens or even uh, the, the recently released 8K screens uh, we, in, uh, we are able to manufacture full HD 3D um, 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 uh, displays uh, which gives you a really sharp uh, um, uh, performance and uh, yeah that will be absolutely uh, another step forward in the development of technology um, and we have already developed a, a number of prototypes in in 4K uh, and the uh, performance is absolutely amazing uh, for that. How exciting. Um, 
eye tracking. Let, let's talk about eye tracking. You know, it's one way of getting around this issue of only one person being able to see the 3D effect at the same time. But that's not necessarily true because obviously right here at ISC, there's lots of people looking at it. But how does eye tracking work? Is that a mechanical process or is that a visual process? How, how does that effect get achieved? Well, without uh, revealing too much of it, but uh, uh, I, the basic of eye tracking is that the, the position of the viewer is being locked down uh, by the eye tracking software and thereby, <coughs> sorry, thereby it's changing the, the rendering view of the uh, stereo, um, uh, uh, let's say stereo view to the display and thereby a single person can enjoy a perfect 3D picture from any position in front of the display. However, that's applicable for one person only. So if you have more persons, uh, then only the, the one who is being recognized by the eye tracking will be able to enjoy the, uh, the perfect 3D picture whilst the other ones are not, uh, uh, are not in, the, in the right position. So uh, for single users like gaming or, or in slot machines in casinos, that's a very nice application. Uh, but for public signage again, where multiple people are looking to the display, uh, eye tracking is not a solution yet. Are the lens is moving individually then, or how does, how does it work? No, the lens is actually fixed. It's basically the rendering, uh, the, the views of the, uh, the rendering, which is, uh, which is uh, changed. Okay, I got you. Yes. Um, the, the problem is with, with both Parallax and Lenticular, uh, we're always surely going to have the issue of, of restrictive viewing cones and difficulty with more than one person watching. Are we not going to have to have a whole radically different approach to how we achieve glasses-free 3D in the home in the future? Well, we have been... Uh, um, that's a good question. Um, up till now, there's no, no technology yet to the market uh, that has proved to be better than Lenticular. Um, and actually, we have been recently standardized by the MPEG community as being the technology standard for further standardization. Uh, that means that a lot of people, industry experts, have uh, looked at different technologies and have decided that our Lenticular uh, technology is the most promising for the future. Uh, so that gives us a, a very, let's say, comfortable position to, uh, to further develop uh, improvements based on our current standard. Okay. Uh, obviously the Nintendo 3DS didn't seem to do as well as expected and I understand that a lot of people with the 3DS after a couple of weeks just end up playing it in 2D HD mode. Were you surprised at that? Uh, well, actually, in, in fact, not really because I played it myself as well in the beginning. And uh, yeah, exactly the, uh, the disadvantages of Parallax Barrier, which I uh, uh, explained in the beginning, are, uh, yeah, are quite hindering. And uh, um, so the, the loss of color, the loss of, of picture performance um, are, yeah, let's say to a certain extent that people lose the, the fun in the game itself. And thereby, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's not really surprising that people use it more in 2D mode than in 3D. I think the 3D mode in, 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 in Parallax is not to the, uh, let's say, to the level that, that gamers would like it to be. Oh, so, yeah, I, I used it and you keep losing the effect, don't you? If it's a game that you're getting sort of excited about, you keep losing it because you're shaking the console all the time. So, uh, I never quite understood that. Um, the, the, obviously, the displays look great. There's a lot of attention here. Um, why aren't we seeing these more? I can't understand. It seems like an advertiser's dream. You walk past, everybody are gawping at these screens. I know in the interview we just did that uh, you, it shows, us, I think, about 45% increase in audience attention. Where, where are these screens? Why aren't I seeing them in the London Underground and the train stations and the airports? Well, that's a good question. Um, um, we recently have uh, started to, to pick up the, the activities uh, um, uh, since last year again, so we're now actively approaching the market with, uh, with displays. Um, they are being used in some environments uh, already, some public environments uh, in, in Japan and in Austria and in the Netherlands, uh, in the USA. We have some projects uh, that we are uh, now implementing our displays again and uh, uh, with good results. Um, the reason that it's, it's not being uh, applied in a very, uh, let's say, in a broader manner is, uh, to my knowledge, is that it's still quite a, uh, a new technology for people and the marketing people are in that sense pretty conventional and they base their decisions on facts and figures and up till now there were not really any facts and figures of how well 3D would perform in, a, uh, in an advertising uh, area. So um, in cooperation with a university as mentioned earlier uh, we did that study that, that we now have facts and figures that 3D really works and attracts 45 percent more attention uh, with the same content in, in 2D. So so there's a lot of advertising value in, uh, in 3D and I'm sure, let's say, with these kind of studies, these type of studies, we will be able to, uh, uh, yeah, to uh, also convince advertisers of the added value of 3D. 
I, I would have thought another barrier would have been the fact that you just can't put a Sky 3D or Astro 3D or any kind of side-by-side uh, -side feed into these screens. So does, does content have to be pre-processed? Uh, how are you getting around that issue right now? Yeah, that's also a very important barrier uh, up till now because uh, the content for, uh, for 3D scheme, screens um, 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 yeah, needs to be pre-developed, uh, pre pre-configured. Um, however, we are also working uh, with, uh, with external companies on a auto-conversion solution that basically allows you to uh, input uh, stereo content from different sources into our screens. We currently have a solution working where you connect a uh, uh, where you connect a camera, a stereo camera, and get the 3D images. And we're also partnering with with external companies who are specialized in the field of, of converting images from uh, from 2D uh, or stereo into auto stereo. Uh, so that will help us in the applications quite significantly. Apart from advertising, what else could these be used for, though? I mean, entertainment or... Yeah, absolutely. Entertainment is, uh, is one of the, the interesting markets. But uh, also think about uh, enhancing uh, your understanding of complex pictures. Uh, look at engineering sites, for example, which are, uh, uh, for example, placed in different locations in the world. If developers are engineering uh, uh, cut uh, drawings and they need to explain what they have been doing, then uh, 3D helps them uh, to explain a lot better what, uh, let's say, what the picture looks like. But also the medical world, where a lot of stereo content is being generated, uh, can really benefit from, uh, from seeing uh, objects in 3D. So, for example, CT scanners, MRIs, endoscopic uh, data, that all generates stereo content. And, uh, yeah, for a doctor, it would be much more information seeing the object or seeing him working in a uh, 3D environment because then the, the factor depth is added and he gets a better understanding of what is actually happening. I've heard that before. I, I've heard that uh, 3D is one of those... When surgeons, for example, have used 3D, they say it would not have been possible if it wasn't with 3D, things like doing remote surgery and things. Another fascinating topic. Finally, you're uh, joining the um, auto stereo specialist Triaxis uh, with an exciting project at the 3D storytelling event next, uh, next month in March. Can you please elaborate on what you're doing? It's a bit of a world first, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so we're going to absolutely show a very interesting application at the 3D storytelling event. Uh, what we're going to do there is showing a, um, um, a teleconference in 3D, autostereoscopic 3D, between Tomsk in Russia, where our partner Triaxis is based, and the storytelling event in London. Uh, and what we're going to do there is uh, yeah, show that, that in two different places in the world, people can enjoy uh, the images from those different locations in 3D, real time. And uh, yeah, that's going to be, uh, let's say, uh, adding another interesting added value to, uh, to our uh, uh, 3D technology. So you're going to have a group of people in Tom's, a group of people in London. They'll be able to see each other without glasses in 3D. And Triaxis will be generating that multiple viewpoint on the fly in real time. And then you'll be able to talk between two groups. Sounds yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, that's, indeed, uh, that's indeed the setup that we are working on. And uh, yeah, that will go over IP, so we'll have a real-time application seeing each other in 3D. Wonderful. Uh, I mean, that, that sounds exciting. Well, if you want to get yourself down there, it's uh, 3D Storytelling March 22nd, 23rd. And it's a completely free event. It's a really good 3D event. I went last year. And it's 3dstorytelling.co.uk. But uh, for now, Bas, thank you so much. If you want to know more, it's dimenko.eu.